Hello folks, welcome to the Kangles. A lovely morning today. It's uh, remarkably, well, it was sunshiny until you, of course, until, until you folks arrived. I blame you, it's not my fault. <laughs> um, yeah, we had a lovely sunshiny morning. It's been raining all night, it looks like, because it's really wet down by my feet, but it's uh, beautiful and sunshiny, mostly, just now. Um, Yes, so, hello, I'm Sam. I'll do a little screen flip to say hi. Hey folks, I'll get a nice backgroundy thing, shall I? Good morning, um, I'm Sam. I am the Cairngorms Rare Plants and Wild Connections Project Officer. Good to see you all for our uh, uh, anniversary session. Um, so this is, oh, that's turning my camera off. Um, this is a, a little bit of a three year celebration stream for the Cairngorms project. So we've been, uh, it's almost to the date, I think, um, running this project for three years now, doing all sorts of work for rare plants in the Cairngorms. Whether that be in pine woods, such as we're in now, you can see us below a lovely few Scots pine trees here. Um, or whether that's in meadows, or whether that's in um, uh, lower cut wax cap grasslands, such as amenity grasslands or graveyards or sites like that, or whether that's on mountain tops. So we're doing all sorts of bits and bobs basically this project, getting the community going. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in time, but I thought first as a, as a little wee introduction to enjoy the moment and also just to uh, uh, allow a few more folks to arrive. I thought we might just, we might just get down and have a, have a look at what's in the floor below us here, because it's probably a little more unusual for for some folks. Um, it's a kind of a pine woods flora, a woodland flora is a little different from you get in, in broadleaf trees, a little fly settles on my hand. Um, so, so you probably know some of these species, there's quite an obvious one in front of us here. Um, good old heather, this is just heather, it doesn't have any particular other names, it's just uh, uh, ling would be the other one I suppose, but there's no you know common or anything like that. Um, the very small kind of uh, lilac flowers you get on heather like this. Um, whereas you might be familiar also with bell heather, which has much bigger, more reddy, um, purple, pinky flowers. Um, uh, that's kind of the other common one. There's also crossleaf, which is fairly common too. Um, you tend to find the others not so much in pine woods. I don't think there's any around here. You see all the heather, which is beautiful in flower at the moment, is all the same sort of colour. So I think we've all got ling around us here. Uh, heather, ling, the same thing. And next to me here. The, the green leafy thing. Again, I imagine a fair few of you will be familiar with this one. This is a uh, blaberry or bilberry down in England. It's, it's the same thing. It's just always got different names in Scotland or England. Um, blaberry is the Scottish name. B-L-A-E berry. Um, and if I get out, like go down there, you can see where it gets its name. There's the berry. I'm just going to nab that because they're delicious. Nom, nom, nom. Um, love a blaberry. <laughs> Don't worry, there's plenty. I'm not stealing that much. <laughs> It's always quite prolific in these sorts of woodlands as well. You can see um, between the heather and the blaberry, that's kind of the dominant, dominant ground flora when it comes to um, vascular plants anyway. But there's also plenty of mosses. And when you get down and nitty gritty in this, you can see all underneath absolutely everything. It's all mosses down there, various different kinds of species. Um, and there's a few interesting ones to look at. So this one we've got here, this is quite a nice indicator for our project. Um, this is uh, Hylocomium splendens, uh, glittering wood moss, uh, very common, you see it covering all sorts of sites. It's a real distinctive feature is this kind of reddy, reddy brown stem you see on that, along with the yellowy green uh, leafy sections. But it can be quite similar to a lot of the feather mosses, so you've got to be very careful uh, separating those out. Um, what else do we have around here? Not that I'm an expert on mosses, but I know some of them. Yes, so here we go. This is, this is the two different mosses next to each other. This is one of the feather mosses. Uh, Pitchulum, something like that, I can't remember, but there's a few of them, I'm not going to try to identify which one it is offhand. You see it's very similar to the hy Hylocomium, the, the glittering wood moss, but it's not got that um, uh, reddish brown centre point there, and it's sort of a greeny, you know, bug just crawling up my hand there. Um, it's not that, got that, uh, it's got a greeny centre instead, and actually if you get, I suspect the camera won't allow me to do it very well, oh, sorry moss, um, but if you get that, it's very, very much more like feathery peacock feathers, um, along the along the kind of branches of the stem there, whereas Hyalocomium splendens is a bit more, a bit more branched, a bit more separated. You see that. Uh, but anyway, I'm getting into very nitty gritty, nitty gritty territory here. Uh, but that's always fun, isn't it? Um, oh, this is a nice one. 
uh, Polytrichum. So this is a nice wet moss. You probably have seen this at some point when you've been out in woodlands. So this one grows really long. So you can see if I stick my hand in here, it just keeps going down to the ground. So that's at least kind of, you know, my hand span. Well, my, my finger and my, my hand, my palm length into the ground there. They're really, really long, the stems of these. You can see that just there. Um, uh, this is hair cap moss. Uh, there's a few uh, hair cap mosses out there uh, with different kind of names. Um, I'm not going to try and identify this one. Probably could be common hair cat moss, uh, bank hair cat moss. There's a few of those. Uh, again, with most most of the kind with mosses, you really got to get nitty gritty with uh, microscopes to be confident. Uh, but that's a nice indicator of wet spots. So you see, if I stand back up here and go back a bit, you see that's kind of nestled in between the, the hummocks, which might be an old um, tree stump or something else there in this little little gully almost. So that's a tiny little microhabitat wet spot just there. You can see around it here. There's a few rushes as well. So that's, that's a, uh, a little wood rush there of some sort. Um, classic uh, woodlandy species. You get some of the bigger wood rushes as well in broadleaf woodlands, but you get, tend to get the finer ones here. They prefer the acid sites. And these are uh, these very fine grasses as well. And uh, oh, just here, there's always something else to see, isn't there? Um, this is more of a meadow species. Um, don't tend to see it. Well, you, you do get it in woodlands, but you'd think of it as a meadow species. This is Tormentil. So this gets tiny little yellow flowers, flowers, four petaled yellow flowers just on these stems here, which have all gone over now because it's a bit later in the year. Um, but it grows with these little sharp jaggedy uh, points. The flowers look a bit, little bit like mini buttercup flowers. It's probably one of the, the easiest ways to look at them, uh, think about them. And let's see, what else do we have? So you see it's quite rich just as you're walking around. I've only walked about, you know, one or two meters from where I started the stream, seeing a lot. So, I mean, there'll be loads of this, but I'm going for one that's tricky, of course. This is a... Um, um, uh, chickweed wintergreen. So very confusingly, it's not a chickweed or a wintergreen, <laughs> um, but it is a very pretty little flower, white flowering head. Uh, of course, again, the flowers are all gone over now because it's a bit later in the season, but they're only fine little plants. Uh, very, very much pine wood specialists. You will only find them along with Scots pines or I suppose other pine species as well sometimes. So the Scots is our classic native pine. Just to have another look up at the Scots pine I'm standing next to here. Very, very, very tall around me. Um, just for those who joined a bit later so you can see them. Uh, let's have a li little wee walk, see what else we can find before I chat about anything else. Eh? So here's a lovely patch of Tormund Hill just there. You can see it's growing very, very happily. Um, just nestled in next to this blaberry. What else do we have? Have a little hunt. Have a little hunt. I bet there's a few more things in here. So this, ah, this, this um, leafy thing here, now you'd be forgiven for thinking, oh, especially on camera, which is a bit, you know, it's a bit forgivable that for not having a good clear view. Um, that is blaberry. Yeah, this is some blaberry over here. But if you look close, you see the leaves are a little bit different. Uh, there's another one just there next to it. Leaves are a little bit different, a little bit smaller, maybe a little harder looking, a little more waxy almost. Um, actually, this is cowberry, which is a little more of a rough growing species. I say rough growing, blaberry can grow right up to the tops of mountain tops. Um, but this, this is uh, more or less evergreen. It tends to keep its leaves all year round, whereas blaberry drops its leaves. And one of the distinctive features of cowberry is if you get your hand on the actual leaf, I'll show you doing it, on the actual leaf, you can feel the rim of the leaf kind of curls downwards slightly, like there's a little lip on the inside of the leaf. That's one of your easy ways to identify that. They also have uh, red berries as opposed to the, um, the uh, bluey the dark bluey berries of blaberry, one of which I managed to nab earlier. <laughs> oh, oh, here we go. Uh, some of you might have spotted the star in the show, which we're going to get to in a moment, but that's more talking about project stuff. So first of all, I'll show you the plant that oh, I've now just completely lost. Ah, there's a flower. That's my sign. <laughs> come on, come here, you. There it is. So that is a little cow wheat flower. Uh, can I find the actual plant that it came from is the question. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to be able to, know, am I? Uh, I did see a common cow wheat. It's probably common cow. Ah, there's one. Um, this is common cow wheat. Uh, again, likes these sorts of pine woodsy habitats. Lovely, lovely little plant with yellow flowers. There's also a small cow wheat, which is quite a rare plant, which is a few conservation projects working on at the moment. Um, but the common one you see, uh, as, as the name would suggest, fairly commonly around these sorts of parts just as the sun's coming out and my headphone cable is getting caught and stolen by a heather. Oh, come here, there we go. Um, now, as I mentioned, the star of the show. So, I'll do a bit of a flip and then we'll get to the star of the show, which is in front of me. Go to sunshine, look at that sunshine in the Cairngorms. Um, so, I'm Sam, just for those who are joining a bit later, uh, Cairngorms Rare Plants and Wild Connections Project Officer. I've just been doing a bit of a re we walk around the woodlands there. And 
I'm here today to celebrate the Kangles project's third year anniversary. Um, and we're uh, working on all sorts of different species. We're, pine woods in general are our interest, of course, but we're actually looking at specific species within those pine woods. It's one of the areas that we're working on. And one of those species is just in front of us here. So this, if I can get my shadow out of the way, is twin flower. This is very much a, a Scottish specialist, only grows in pine woods, uh, and it's uh, sadly declined quite heavily in the last few hundred years. Um, if you were to go somewhere, like, uh, it's this all this here, you see, with these stones growing across the ground with the little paired uh, leaves. Now, if you, if you were to go somewhere like um, Norway, this would be everywhere, you know, the pine woods there would be absolutely covered in it. Here, you can see there's a fair amount of it, you can see it's underneath me here, you know, it's growing, but there's really a patch. If I were to walk just over here, and have a look around, I wouldn't see any twin flower. But just here, it's here. You see? Those little circular flowers. Uh, I see a question there. Where am I? I am in the Cairngorms National Park. I am near Granton, Granton on Spey. So the North Cairngorms and the Spey Valley. Um, you can see all those tiny little circular flowers down there. Um, that's twin flower, and there's a little patch of it here, so it's probably going to go somewhere into the distance over there, kind of 10, 15 metres in front of me, something like that. I think it keeps going in that direction, actually, a wee bit further. Um, so, twin flower, it grows in these patches like this, but what that actually is, this patch in front of me right here, this is all one individual plant growing in stolons, creeping across the ground. Um, so I'll see if I can find you a twin flower at some point, actually. That's kind of its namesake, because the creeping green growth, while it's, it's quite pretty, isn't exactly the most charismatic thing, necessarily. Um, uh, and don't worry, I can walk on it a bit. It actually really quite likes disturbance. It tends to grow very well where it's been a little bit disturbed. Um, but while we're looking for the flower, I'll keep on talking about it. So basically, these, these patches around me now are just one individual. Um, in nearly all the sites in the Cairngorms and Pinewood sites in general, um, we've only got one single clonal individual, which might have spread over 10, 15, 20 meters. Um, but ah, there's a perfect example, look at that. But it, um, sadly, because it's only one clone, it can't reproduce. Here's the namesake twin flower. Oh, sorry, flower. Isn't it just a lovely little thing? Linnea borealis. Uh, and in fact, uh, Linnea, as Carl Linnaeus, absolutely loved the little plant. It was one of his favorites. Um, and uh, yes, Blaybury is also known as Bilberry. Uh, Blaybury in Scotland, Bilberry in England. <laughs> Just to confuse, we've always got different names of these things. Um, so this is a very late one. Uh, in, if you were here in kind of June, July, there would have been the whole wood would have been covered in these things. Um, as it is now, we've only got uh, a few of them because it's much, much later in the season. Um, but as I was saying, these plants, because it's just the one um, clonal population here, it really struggles to reproduce, as you can imagine. It, it doesn't, um, it's not been being pollinated. Because um, the pollinators are thought to be only very small hoverflies, like the pinewoods hoverfly, which is also in massive decline. Inevitably, these things connect up together, don't they? Um, and uh, uh, basically, they can only travel about 10 to 20 meters, it's thought, maybe 50 meters, something like that. So you can imagine, you know, if you've got flowers dotted all over here, fine. But if this woodland is isolated, um, a long way from all other woodlands in the area, um, pinewoods in the area, and there's only one clone in here, well, how, how are they going to be pollinated? There's no way. So that's one of the problems we're addressing. And actually, it's kind of a really nice, easy win-win conservation uh, uh, issue. Because what we're doing is we're um, collecting cuttings from these populations. Cuttings, by the way, with this plant grow really, really well. You just get kind of some of these, these creeping stolons. Um, usually about 30 centimeters of one like this, and you get back. And when you get back in there, I won't pull it out now because I don't know how the plant. But when you get back in there, you, uh, you get little rootlets that are about this long. Sometimes they go a bit longer. Um, and then once you've got a few of them, you know you've got a cutting that can survive by itself. You plant them out, either you can plant them out to grow on if you've been doing some of them, or you plant them out directly to a new site. And then you mix and match, so you get 15, 20, well sorry, I'm saying 15, 20, six different clones, I'm saying 15, 20, because we've got that through the whole project, which is across all different sites. Uh, six different clones introduced to a new site, rather than just the one clone, which is in many of these woodlands. Um, because the plants can't, you know, move across woodlands without, you know, um, connection in between. Us moving the clones directly allows them to start um, uh, being pollinated again. And when they're pollinated, they can set seed. And when they're setting seed, their seeds actually, they're tiny little adorable things. There probably won't be any here because, well, I'll explain in a minute, but basically most of the time most flowers aren't being pollinated. Um, uh, when they set seed, their seeds actually have these little tiny hooks on them and they can be 
uh, moved around by deer or dogs or perhaps even humans um, to new sites. So that would be, then it would, its own natural processes of uh, colonization could restart. But it's probably not been doing that in the highlands for at least a few hundred years. Uh, and that's mainly through habitat fragmentation. You know, these pine woods, a site like this, I'll show you the trees again, with the lovely uh, big old pine trees up above me. Scots pines is very, very rare. You know, you'll get plantation woodlands, but even they are very partitioned up. And a plantation is not suitable because you're going to clear fell it. So you can imagine the twin flowers just not going to be able to survive. Um, yes, so that's twin flower. I think, I think I've probably covered most of the twin flower uh, stuff here. And that's one of our focus species. So we've been doing this translocation project. Now, you probably noticed this rather big chunk of devastation next to me here. Um, looks a bit, looks a bit sad and grim, doesn't it? Well, I assure you it's for very good reason, and the very good reason you may be able to spot is right in the middle. Yes, Pinus sylvestris, well done. <laughs> um, that's the Latin name for Scots pine, by the way. Um, I'm sure some of you may recognize this. This is a rhododendron plant, so this is an invasive, and all of this wood around it is um, also from this non-native invasive, so you can see when I step back how big this big old bush would have been. I don't trip over while walking backwards. Um, and actually, it probably would have been a lot bigger, and these heathers have kind of recovered around it over time. So we've been working with the estate here to control the rhododendron on the site. And this is a really big threat for these sorts of sites because it absolutely goes mental. It absolutely loves this climate. And we're on the east coast here, well, central east. Um, but on the west coast, it's even worse, unfortunately. So don't mind me, but I'm just going to uh, pull that little plant. Sorry, plant, you're not wanted here. But if we let that go, I know it's always a bit sad, but if we let that go on a site like this, that would be a bush in 10, 15, 20 years. It would start reproducing, and then it's going to completely dominate this site. And before you know it, this is nothing but rhododendron growing 15 feet high. Nothing else could grow here. And it's very sad, but it just doesn't have the natural predators that it needs to control it here. Um, so that's one of the things we've been engaging with as well. We've been getting volunteers out. We've been helping the estate manage that sort of thing as well. <laughs> But anyway, you could probably also notice these stakes here. So this is quite a special site. So not only does it have twin flower, and I was talking about that twin flower, it actually has a few clones of twin flower here as well. The, thing, the thought is they've been uh, introduced in the past. So that means that um, uh, these populations are actually being pollinated successfully somewhat. If I had a really good route around, I might be able to see a, a seed head developing from the flowers this year, which happens almost never in the wild, which is very exciting. Um, but I don't have time for that right now. <laughs> Um, but yes, I was saying, you probably notice these canes here. So these are demarking something arguably even rarer than twin flowers. I'm just going to walk on the outside of them because I do have a fair idea where they are. But I'm not 100% and I don't want to risk anything. I'll head to a spot that I am absolutely sure we have lots and lots of these plants. I'm keeping you all on hooks here. <laughs> now, just, just for interest, here's a, a little, get off my screen fly. Here's a little um, uh, birch regen. You can see there's a row in here. Uh, I just wanted to look up and see a birch, and I, I didn't. Oh, there's a birch there. You can see the birch behind. Um, could be silver birch or downy birch from this distance. I can't really tell. It might be downy. Um, these sorts of low-growing trees aren't a big problem here. There's actually uh, the nice plants we like and twin flower growing underneath the, the bigger rowan over there. No problem with this regen in moderation. Obviously, we need to keep an eye on it. But ideally, a nice natural grey should keep them down as well. And here's a nice regenerating um, Scots pine, which is actually really good stuff. We want to see that because it's actually probably a bit more open than we might otherwise like here. This is somewhat of an artificial site. I mean, it is arguably a completely artificial site. It was probably a plantation a very, very long time ago, and they've been let go. You see how all these trees have grown? This doesn't look like, you know, a natural tree. Well, a natural tree shape, does it? It looks like they've grown very, very artificially tall, and then all the um, green is at the top. Um, uh, not that this is, we're absolutely certain of it, but this is probably because um, they were grown in much higher density before, and quite a few of the plants were removed 100 years ago or something like that, maybe less. Um, and now we've got this very open woodland, so it would be nice to see a few more trees settle in here. Anyway, I said I was going to show you something special, and I've been distracted, haven't I? Uh, let me get my bearings. Yes, I'm in the right location. Um, so just here, in front of me, I've got to be quite careful because I don't want to trample them, we see something... I think, uh, maybe they mean the twin flower here, but no, that's a bit of a mine. I think even more special than twin flower, perhaps. Let me get right down on my knees. See these weird little things? If anyone guesses what these are offhand, absolutely 
full full marks to you. I'll be really impressed. These little green leafy things here, you see. These are one-flowered wintergreen, Menesis uniflora. So this is another focus species for us. Um, this is a. Uh, this doesn't grow like twin flower. It grows all over the forest floor with stolons. This actually um, uh, has individual rosettes. Um, and these little flowering heads you can see here. So one flowered because these are individual flower heads, just single flowers. And many of them have not flowered, as you can see. You've just got the kind of, I often describe them as cabbages, the green leafy cabbagey heads. And this little patch here, I think there were about 70 odd in this patch, if I remember correctly from the survey we did, in this one tiny meter square. Uh, this represents about 10% of the population on this site. And this site, say about 700, has probably um, uh, about, some, somewhere between a tenth and a fiftieth of the whole UK population. So there's probably not more than 15 to 20,000 plants, um, Manisa uniflora plants in the UK. It might sound like quite a lot, but it's really not when it comes to a plant at all, especially given, you know, we're talking about that spread across about eight sites. Um, and that's, those sites are obviously, if, if uh, they're not specifically protected, if, those, if something was to happen to one of those sites, uh, we'd be losing a significant chunk of the population. Lovely little head of Cladonia there as well. Um, that's reindeer. It's actually called reindeer moss, confusingly, quite often loads as a lichen, as you can see. It's the flowering head of it. They often get little um, red baubles on the end of the heads. But anyway, I'm getting distracted by interesting things. So, Monesis uniflora, yes. Um, one flower wintergreen. So, we're also working on this species. A lot of what we're doing with this one, because it's been much less studied and understood than um, twin flower. Twin flower being Carl Linnaeus' favourite plant and the, the poster boy of the Linnaean Society and all that. Whereas, one flower wintergreen, poor little thing, doesn't really get so much attention. Um, but it's a very interesting plant. It's actually, um, uh, what's the word, partial, partial mycoheterotrophy, um, which basically means that what it's doing is it's stealing a lot of its energy from the fungi in the soil. Um, uh, we don't know how much, so partial means that it, it chooses effectively. It, it can choose to photosynthesize a bit more, or it can choose to um, uh, basically steal from the fungi a bit more. But it always associates closely with pines. Uh, and we think that it associates with pine wood fungi species. There's been some research on that quite recently. Um, and we're doing, we're kind of involved with people at uh, Rob Tannic Gardens Edinburgh and others who are researching this sort of thing. Um, uh, and actually, I'll tell you what, what, you've just asked the question, I don't know the area, what mammals do you have and how do they affect the work with the plants you're studying? That's a very, very interesting question because that's actually very crucial to uh, Manisus uniflora, the one flower wintergreen that we're talking about now. So basically, um, uh, one of the big problems we've had about understanding it is it's it's in all sorts of sites. So it's not this is a I mean, you might think of this in a way as a lovely pristine pine woods. It's sort of not, it's sort of artificial, but you know, what's the what is a natural environment nowadays? Um but it also grows in uh plantation woodlands um quite happily, um, under different types of pines as well sometimes in certain specific sites, but only in very, very specific and very rare sites. Um and I, with the research that I've been doing, along with others, has suggested that it actually very much associates with uh, disturbance, and not just kind of grazing pressure and that sort of thing, but actually a very particular kind of soil disturbance, ground disturbance, and bare ground. You see where it's growing here? It's kind of growing among dead wood, uh, kind of shallower soils, the mossy spots. You can see what I'm talking about here, kind of that disturbed ground. And actually what we were seeing earlier, you can see if I look round, all this disturbed ground with the, um, where the rhododendron has been removed and killed off here to help control on the site. Um, the Manisa uniflora of the wintergreen is actually doing very well uh, in some of those spots. And that's because of this partial microheterotrophy I was talking about, perhaps, is our theory. Because basically the fungi are rotting all this wood, which should be helping the, um, the Manisa uniflora. That's the theory, anyway. <laughs> Um, also, maybe it just likes to seed itself in bare ground. That's how it spreads. It's a bit of a successionary plant. You know, it's not something that stays put forever. So my current kind of working theory is actually that it really likes um, uh, kind of disturbance. It's naturally adapted to go alongside beavers or boar or other species like that. Uh, and that's why we're looking at it. And we're just not clear about what exactly we're looking for, basically, um, because we're looking for a kind of habitat type. And actually what it's associating with is, is uh, other species more than anything else. Um, and a type of disturbance. So what we often see is it growing in forestry tracks in woodlands um, where the ground has been heavily disturbed and torn up by forestry vehicles, but it won't stay there forever if there's not that continual disturbance. So. Anyway, it's very complicated. We're working on this and we're also doing a trial translocation to a few sites to try and learn if we can move this plant because often what happens is these individual plots are very, very um, 
uh, under threat, and there's no protection for them in a lot of cases, unfortunately. So if someone were to decide to deforest here and change land use, um, we need to have the option to do something with that if possible. So we're trying to figure out if it's possible to translocate and uh, how that might work, how we might be able to, be able to make that better, along with understanding the habitat. But anyway, I've nattered on about one flower wintergreen enough, I think. Uh, here's another one that's quite interesting. I'm not going to pull it now because it'll be a bit of a faff, but this is um, spruce. Um, you can always tell spruce by if you squeeze it, it hurts. <laughs> it's spiky. Um, it's very, very fine needles that all look the same size as opposed to Scots pine. You can see a Scots pine regen here, much, much more long, wiry needles. Um, look over there in the distance, you can see all that dark tree over there. That's all spruce. Um, there's actually quite a few pines here. It's a bit more exotic pines as well, um, not just spruce trees. Um, which aren't so much a problem, but can be. But sadly, the spruce would swamp this site if we let it grow, so we're also kind of keeping an eye on that one um, and pulling it when it seems like it's a problem here, because ideally this would obviously be native Scots pine. We don't want it to be covered in spruce. Oh, and the spruce can be a really big problem at some sites. Um, heather moorland often, rare heather moorland sites with peat bogs, can be a really badly affected by spruce regeneration. Uh, it's something we often have to work to control. Um, yeah, so I'll... Oh, sorry about that. I'll do a quick... A quick flip. Hello for those who haven't seen me yet. I've had the camera facing away from me for a while. Um, so that's two of the species we're working on in the Cairngorms. Uh, I'll do a quick whirl round just because we're kind of celebrating the project here, aren't we? I'll do a quick whirl round and, uh, and talk about um, the, the other parts of the project in general. So alongside doing the, um, the rare woodland plants, the twin flower and the one flower wintergreen work, uh, we're working in meadows. So we're working with farmers to trial mob grazing techniques in the Cairngorms. It's kind of a new uh, grazing method that involves partitioning cattle up in quite small areas and moving them around the field quite rapidly with the intention of rejuvenating sites from improved semi-improved grassland, which is uh, a species poor ryegrass sward, uh, into um, a much richer natural, probably up here quite acidic, um, uh, ground flora, a sward that the cattle not only will they very much enjoy it, um, but also of course good for good for species richness, good for nature. Um, and actually that's a really interesting point the farmers maintain the cattle are really enjoying it, they're really appreciating um, having the movement but also having some of the species from more species rich sword. So it does work for farmers too, although it's a lot of work moving the cattle around regularly. And our part in that is surveying it, seeing how quickly and how much effect this new grazing technique has um, on the species richness on these sites. Um, we're also working on wax cap fungi. We've been surveying uh, across the Cairngorms to see uh, find new no, sites of wax caps. We found a few in Deeside. Wax cap fungi, beautiful, colourful fungi you often find in meadows, shortcut grasslands. You'd find them in amenity grasslands if they've been there for a long time, cut for a long time. Graveyards are a really good place to look for wax cap fungi. They're actually already up. They've been up for nearly a month, which is shockingly early this year because of all the wet weather we've been having. At least up here. I don't know what it's so much what it's like down in the south. Um, but yes, the, uh, the wax cap fungi, we've been looking at new sites, um, surveying those sites, and then uh, kind of working with the landowners to engage and uh, 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 raise awareness of the wax cap fungi on them. Um, and finally, we've done some mountaintop work. We worked with the James Hutton Institute a few years ago on a fungi, again, fun mountaintop fungi surveying, DNA surveying project. And basically it was fascinating because we found out we don't know all sorts of mountaintop fungi, probably most of the species that are in the soil we don't even know, as in we've never encountered at all, we don't know what they are, we don't know what they look like. They don't fruit, or at least in any way we perceive. So what are they? Because we can't get in the soil and look at them, because fungal hyphae are microscopic tiny things. So DNA analysis is allowing us a whole new window into this world of fungi. So that's something we're looking at as well in partnership with the James Hutton Institute. We, we went up and did surveys with volunteers, uh, organised volunteers to go up to all sorts of sites across the Cairngorms. Um, I think it was every Munro in the Cairngorms, if I remember correctly. And we found quite a uh, quite a lot of new species of fungi. We found a new new to the UK for an Arctic species. I can't remember the name of our hand, apologies. No, a fungi, uh, first time we've ever discovered in this country, which is very exciting. Uh, and we found all sorts of other rare and wonderful species there. So the hope is that will be continued across Scotland, which is really, really exciting stuff. And we'll learn more about mountain fungi, and how climate change might change the communities we have on our mountain tops, because obviously those sorts of sites are most special. Sorry, don't mind me, you probably can't see them, but there's a few midges and other flies around. <laughs> um, anyway, flip buns, difficult to see, but there we go. I'll flip back round and we can, um, that's kind of my celebration of the Cairngorms. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm kind of happy with that there, but I've seen a few other things around. So I might just have a wee wonder and we can look and see what other plant species we can see. Uh, and I'll give folks a, a bit of a chance to post any comments they've got or any, any questions or anything like that in the chat. And I'll keep an eye out for things. Uh, I don't think we've had any specific questions in the questions tab. No, we're all good. So I'll, uh, I'll just keep looking at things. And if you've got any, any other queries, I'll keep an eye on the phone. So this is a nice one here. Um, now, 
I'm not an expert botanist, so I might get it wrong. Apologies if I do, but I believe this, if I can get it out, uh, is lesser tway blade. Yeah, I think it is, uh, which is a, actually a species of orchid. Um, yeah, so um, this is uh, uh, a lovely plant. It's quite rare. Uh, again, pine wood specialist you get in these sorts of sites. And if we could find some leaf, I'd be feeling more confident. There's a little bit down there. Um, but anyway, quite difficult to see. It's, it, it, it doesn't really get much more colourful than this. Um, <laughs> it kind of grows like this all the time. Um, uh, I'm doubting myself now, though I know there was less of a on this site, but um, uh, apologies if I've got that wrong. I'll move away now. <laughs> um, as I say, I'm not a, not a plant expert. Uh, and speaking of lichens, because uh, I spotted you posted the lichens there, there's a few lovely ones around here. Uh, again, I'm not a, a lichenologist, not an expert, but I do know a few, um, so I can have a good go. Uh, we've got some lovely reindeer lichen here, look at that. Or well, reindeer moss it's called, but it is a lichen. Uh, Cladonia, that's the easy way of thinking about it. So this is all fruiting at the moment, you can see. So um, the actual lichen growth itself is this stuff here. So that's what the kind of main body of the lichen looks like most of the time. Um, and these are all the little heads, fruiting heads. So if I get in real close, you can see the tiny little red dots on the top of that one. Um, so that is um, uh, basically what it's actually fruit. The, the, I don't know if you could say kind of fruit or flowering. Probably fruiting with, with lichens, wouldn't it be? Um, uh, that's basically the tiny little um, lichen. Oh, caught me now. What's the word? It's not seed. Spore? Maybe spore. Lichen spores. <laughs> if anyone in chat knows, let me know. Um, the reproductive parts of the lichen being released to the air because they, they settle, they fly through, they float through the air uh, as fine as dust, just like um, uh, fungi do. Uh, lichen, of course, being a. Uh, I say, of course, not everyone knows, of course. Um, lichen being a, a communal species kind of combined between fungi and algae. So the fungi produce a lot of the structure and then uh, produce roots that grow, high feet in this case, that grow down into the, the substrate and bring up nutrients. And then the, the algae uh, phototh photosynthesize and produce the energy and the sugars for the, uh, the lichens. There's a lovely little cap down there as well. There's a few other lichens in here as well. So, um, uh, oh, my brain's gone blank, apologies. But these are the classic lichens that grow on um, uh, woody stems. There's a few different kinds. You, you, Oh, no, I can't remember. I'm not going to try and push myself. <laughs> it's hard to do it live and get all the names. Um, yeah, you see there's some woody stems of trees and plants. These, these will have actually fallen if I look up. These will have been way up there on the tops of these um, Scots pines, I bet you, on those branches, and they will have fallen down to the ground here. And some of them will still survive on the wood, but they classically grow on Scottish trees uh, all over Scotland because uh, rougher climates up here, cleaner air, um, and it's just sense to suit them better, basically. Um, so they, the, the trees don't grow so well because of the rougher climate, so they tend to be swamped by lichen a bit more. Although there's not actually so much lichen at this site. Um, there's another good example of it. Okay. Oh, hello, frog. <laughs> That's a nice spot. Uh, actually, you look more like a toad than a frog. Not that that it's very helpful for ID necessarily, but it's not the um, common frog. Anyway, I'm not really an expert on amphibians either, so I'm not really going to try. There's a lovely example of the lichen as well. Uh, okay, a yeah, nice close-up of the frog though, how about that? Oh! <laughs> Cute. Anyway, I'll leave it be, I don't want to torment it too much. Um, let's have a bit of a wander, I see if we can see anything else before I, uh, before I finish up the live stream. If anyone else has any questions, let me know. I think we've had a, a fair number of, um, a uh, fair amount of stuff talked about now, and a fair number of people been in and out, so... Um, I'll just keep it going a little bit longer, see what we find. So for those who joined a bit later, just so you know, this, this looks like a bit of a scene of devastation. This site had a, a real issue with rhododendron, which we've been helping the, the local estate manage for over 10 years now. And it's still not completely dealt with, it's still here. Um, but uh, uh, yes, I assume lumpy skin means toad, that makes sense. <laughs> but uh, uh, thankfully most of it's gone and we're keeping an eye on this on the rhododendron on the site. Uh, but that's why we've got these kind of bare ground patches where it's slowly recovering. Uh, another lovely twin flower flower down here for us to enjoy. It's a nice one, so don't see this sort of thing every day. Come on, let me focus on the twin flower. Why would you want to look at anything else? <laughs> uh, you can see why it's such a charismatic uh, little um, 
little flower. Uh, very well loved. Pixie cup lichen. Yes, I think pixie cup is another name people sometimes use for um, um, the tops, basically, the flowering part of Clodonia, uh, reindeer, or lichens. Uh, I think, but they might be a different one. I, I could be wrong. Not the next person that's, oh, look at that. I, just, I love the lichens on these sites. You can enjoy them forever. Um, all those little flowering heads. There's probably a few different species in there as well, but of course we'd have to get really down with a microscope to tell it. Uh, have we other wintergreens here, the pyrolas? Yes, so they often associate on sites. Um, I have seen a little bit of pyrola uh, media. Oh, I forget which the Latin names are. Uh, common wintergreen. Um, I mean, to me, no, my media is intermediate wintergreen, which is one of the common ones. I think I've seen that one on this site um, before, a bit behind me. They tend to like slightly wetter spots than Manisa's uniflora, the one flower wintergreen, but similar, um, similar sorts of habitats. I'll tell you what, I think I've, have I walked past that fascinating tree I have. I'm going to show you this tree actually as well while I'm here. Um, but yeah, they often associate with sites. Um, and actually, uh, there's another plant that associates too, which I haven't seen any of yet, but I know is here. Good year. Oh, what's that? That's all flowering heads, uh, which I'll keep an eye out for, which is um, uh, another kind of leafy flowering plant, which um, lives in very similar habitats and is also very much a, a pine wood specialist. Uh, there's the tree. I'm walking to the wrong one. They all start looking the same. <laughs> Uh, there's a this is a really cool tree this so I'll see I'll give you I, I know what I'll do I'll show you the tree and you can have a wee second to see if you can guess what's so special about it so anyone like hmm it's a bit odd it's just a pine tree up there yeah, same as all the other Scots pine but uh what's going on here this big old dark lump on the side now that's not bare ground <laughs> so anyone anyone any guesses What's going on here? What are these big old dark lumps piled up on the ground around this tree might be indicating? It's alright, I'll give you a minute. <laughs> Actually amazed there's more twin flower down below me here as well. I'm actually amazed how much of it's still in flower. It's meant to be well gone over now, but still seeing the odd flower. These ones just single twin flowers, they're not always paired. No one got any guesses? Ants? Uh, not a bad guess, not a bad guess. But no, I think you'll find if you zoom in, there's no ants. There's the odd spider crawling across it. Um, but there's, there's no ants specifically growing in there. I think that's a fair guess, though. Uh, I'll give you another clue. It smells a bit when you get quite close. <laughs> I'm sorry if you just joined now. We've been looking at beautiful plants all day, and now we're looking at something a little less pleasant, so that's a bit, a bit mean. But it's quite fascinating, I promise. <laughs> hmm. Anyone else got any guesses before I tell you what it is? I'll put you out of your misery then. Yes, there, there we go. Droppings. Well done. Droppings. It's uh, specifically bat. So this is... Um, and actually, I just heard a very, very quiet sound then. You can hear them sometimes. I don't think you'll hear on the microphone, sadly. You can hear them sometimes. Just creeping around inside this crack in this tree. So at some point this tree is twisted and left a crack right the way up. It's probably hollow um, uh, on the inside. Very, very narrow and hollow in there. And bats love that sort of a site. Um, so this, we just spotted it uh, a few few months ago when we were here and we are just like, wow, they must have been living in here for decades to create a pile this big around the tree. Uh, but this is all just bat droppings. Isn't it amazing? So um, uh, living in this tree, probably hundreds of the things living in this tree together. You can see the crack goes right up there and quite a way up. Um, and I suspect, uh, in a site like this, pipistrels, oh, go away, they just, ah, <laughs> um, pipistrels, probably common up here, not soprano pip, pip because we're uh, quite northerly, um, it's quite rough here as well, um, could be dorbentons, um, they often go in trees, but there's not water immediately local, so I don't know if we'd have dorbentons here, I'm not sure about that. Um, trying to think what else it could be. I don't think it would be the other be long-eared or anything like that. Yeah, it's probably one of those bats in there. Not that I've seen any bats here, but I haven't been here in the night, I must admit. We don't tend to go looking for plants in the night so much. <laughs> here, love that little flower. So, if anyone was here right at the beginning, it's still on. This leafy thing is probably recognised. It's got the ridge around the edge. So I'll give you a moment. The ridge around the edge, what's that mean? <laughs> Waxy leaves, ridge around the edge. It is a cowberry. So this is a little cowberry flower. You don't actually see them in flower very often. They're quite 
sparse with their flowering as they just like they are with their berries. Um, I'm not actually sure if they flower at a certain time of year. I feel like they kind of flower a bit whenever, really. Um, but you can see there's quite a lot of flowerberry around here growing among the blaberry, or bilberry, as uh, was correctly pointed out earlier. Um, and we're still among twin flower here, so I think this is probably actually a different clone. Yep, well done. <laughs> Guessing away there. Um, I think we're actually probably a different clone here. As I said, this site quite special because we have a few clones of twin flower rather than just the one at most sites, um, which is unusual. Um, most of the time, the twin flower that remains at these sites is kind of held on just in a tiny corner plot. Um, you, know, you can imagine it's, it, the whole forest is, is removed when they're doing deforestation um, for forestry. Um, clear felling, I should say, um, and then there's a tiny, tiny corner plot that's left, you know, with uh, by some rocks or something with a few trees, and that's where the twin flowers held on. So you can imagine it's only one single clone. Hey, look at this little bird egg. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't really uh, fathom to guess what bird that's going to be. Pure white. See the size there? It's fairly big. Pigeon, maybe dove or something like that. Um, We do get wood, I mean, get wood pigeons everywhere, don't you? So <laughs> wouldn't be surprised. Uh, but if someone else knows their bird eggs very well, welcome to have a guess. Uh, haven't seen any good year yet, which is one of the other plants I was looking for, but oh well. Um, I'll have a wander over and see if we get any nicer fungi in this bit of wood. And I think we'll probably finish up the live stream there because I've been nattering on for what probably about 40 minutes now. Yeah, uh, you're probably all bored of my voice. <laughs> um, so you can see here we're kind of in a bit more more of a scrubby woodlandy regeneration area here so this but this doesn't this isn't necessarily bad for the plants we're talking about on this side the twin flower and the one flower wintergreen um there's a plot of one flower wintergreen just here in fact and if we go down and have a look underneath us you'll see the twin flower hidden among the um labory here um, growing with its paired leaves distinctively and its stolons creeping across the surface you see the baby stem there uh yes lesser tray blade i thought from earlier i'm not sure if you want to Oh, that wasn't good year, was it? Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll ah, here we go. I was looking for wood sorrel earlier. Um, nice bit of wood sorrel. Fairly common plant. See, we get it when it gets a bit more shady under here. Um, but this is a nice one. So actually, um, she come and there's a little cow wheat as well just there. Um, sorry, I'm covering up my hand. Um, wood sorrel, one of the nice. It's very, very common. You get it all over the place. Uh, uh, kind of confuses you because then you've got the field sorrels, which are actually true sorrels. But I'm not going to get into that. Um, and uh, yeah, one little trick with wood sorrel. Uh, it gets pretty pink flowers, and there, there's a seed head because the flowers are done now. Actually, it might. Is it going to pop for me? No, the seed's already gone. If those are in uh, peak, they actually pop for you, which is quite cute. Um, but these little leaves, um, always plenty of air, I don't mind. Um, um, if you want to try a wood sorrel leaf, they're quite nice. They're very um, acidic, quite sharp. Um, very rich in vitamin C, apparently. Oh gosh, that's quite sharp. <laughs> um, but yes, recommended if you need your hit of vitamin C on a walk. And wood sorrel is very common. Yeah, I don't, don't feel too guilty from just nicking one leaf from that one. Well, I don't promote eating all the plants you come across in the woodland. Definitely not for your health, anyway. <laughs> Lovely hard fern. Probably seen hard fern around in various places, but it's always nice to see. Likes the shadier spots again. You can see it in walls as well, quite often. Um, different from the other ferns. You see the other ferns, you get much more... Um, uh, what's the word? Pinatification? I don't know. Lobes? Separation in the leaves, basically. Whereas these kind of have just have big chunky leaves like this, um, which are all whole effectively, all coming from the central stem. Um, if I remember correctly, with my fern ID, there's like three different levels of, um, uh, yeah, kind of uh, branching that you use to identify ferns, kind of from the stem, from the, that stem, and then from the leaf separately as well. Yeah, tastes like green apple. Yeah, that's quite accurate, that is, I think, yeah. Um, this is another scene of devastation here. So we just took out a uh, huge, great big bush here the other week. I think we got most of the root out. I'm glad to see there's no obvious regeneration coming up. Would have been frustrating to see a load of green stems coming straight back up. Um, but yes, sadly, rhododendron keeps coming back. We have to keep bashing back, but we will get there. We will get there. Um, Yes, looks like a little bit was controlled in here as well before before I was about. Oh, a little line of fungi there. So not really a fungi expert, so I'm not going to pretend that I'm absolutely key. But if you do want to identify fungi, usually one of the... I'll get you right down. One of the keys is looking at the gills. 
set, it's quite broad, sorry, it's quite broad gills there, and it looks like they're decorant, they run right up to the top. Looks like to me. Oh. Um, and I don't know what it's funky, I'm not really going to try and attempt it, to be honest. See, there's a little bit of a ring there. So I expect the ring would have come right round like this, going back, but now there's just that corner of it left. Anyway, I think I'll finish up in a moment, but I'll just wander over this way, because I remember seeing a nice patch over here, so I'll find it now. Looking for a lovely patch of belites to finish up on. Oh, this is quite cute, the, the, um, the hard ferns, you see. See these flowering leaves, flowering spikes they've got here. So you see the whole plant, most of it grows quite low, but then this one really sticks up and is much more spaced out in the leaf. And you see it's actually forming the sporophytes, is that what you call them? Ferns? Gosh, they've got all sorts of funny names for these sorts of things. Uh, but you see the very dark underside, whereas if you turn one of these regular ones over, it's just green. Um, so that's its reproductive um, uh, leaf. Basically, it, re it releases spores all along those, from all along those stems. And presumably, it also releases um, gametes, so reproductive cells as well. But I can't pretend I'm an expert on um, fern reproduction. Um, yeah, I think... Oh, there we go. Cowberry. That's a nice, nice. Finally found a lovely cowberry. Talking earlier about the lovely bright red berries of cowberry. There you go. Lovely bit of cowberry. Anyway, as I said, I've been nattering for a wee while. So I think that that might well be enough there. So yes, I'll I'll finish up. Um, thanks very much for joining, folks. Oh, do I the screen there we go. So yeah, thanks very much for joining, folks. It was uh, lovely catching you um, in this beautiful patch of woodland near Granton on Spey, up in the North Cairngorms in the Spey Valley. Um, talking about twin flower and one flower wintergreen, but also talking about flax caps and mountain top species and um, meadow species as well. All the different bits and bobs we work on here in the Cairngorms as part of this project and have been for three years. Um, woo, three years. It's exciting. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much uh, to Heritage Lottery Fund and Cairngorms National Park and Nature Scott for the support. Um, and thanks to you for joining um, on this little little talk. Uh, oh, let me know there's a question there. This one's very well years ago, removing rhododendron. We also remove the top foot or more of soil. Ah, well, ideally, yes. It's very tough to do, um, uh, especially when there's rare plants around. So we're right next to the twin flower on that patch over there, so we have to be really careful because we don't want to go unnecessarily damaging the twin flower. But you have to get down to get the root out. It's just tough as anything. Um, I don't know about specifically foot of soil. Uh, usually the most of the root chunk is within that foot, but it's just wood when you go down a lot of the time when it's old rhododendron. So it's pretty tricky. Um, cool. I'm glad folks enjoyed it. Thank you very much for all the, the lovely comments. Uh, I'm glad, glad that was good. Um, I'll let you go then. So yeah, uh, feel free to check out other stuff Plant Life is doing. And uh, uh, thanks for all the support for those who are supporting us. Um, take care. Bye bye. <laughs>